Hey guys, I'm Chris. Hey everybody, I'm Robert. And we're the Film Flamers. And we are back to continue our conversation and our journey through the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. We and have made it up to four. And thank God we're almost done. Because <laughs> over on Patreon we'll be doing five, right? And then right. I think that's kind of it until next year when we probably, inevitably, we'll talk about Freddy's Dead and maybe, just maybe, the, the meta-cinematic one. New Nightmare? Yeah. New Nightmare, yeah. We'll be doing that one for sure. We have to. Maybe we want to do a good one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. Eventually. Not that Dream Warriors isn't good. Dream Warriors is an amazing movie. I take that back. But hey, we're, we're, some people love this one. That's right. But we're getting into the part of the franchise where it's iffy. They're yeah. just like, okay. Or middling. Or something else entirely. Or something else entirely. We'll get into that, though, I'm (laughs) sure. As we start talking about A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, which is a 1988 American fantasy slasher film directed by Rennie Harlan and written by Brian Helgland and Ken and Jim Wheat, I think under a pseudonym at the time. The film stars Robert Englund, Alice Wilcox, and Danny Hassel. And the plot follows Freddy Krueger as he completes his revenge against the families that killed him, along with using another teen girl to gain access to new victims to satisfy his murderous needs. The film received a huge marketing campaign and shot Freddy Krueger into commercial celebrity. He wasn't already? No. The movie is popularly referred to as the, quote, MTV nightmare of the franchise. It certainly is. Okay, listeners, you can check in, but you can't check out, unfortunately. This is A Nightmare on Street 4, The Dream Master. Do you know what terror is? Hello. Do you live here? Nobody lives here. How long has it been since you've been on Elm Street? Welcome to a brand new nightmare. He is the first in fear. Second to none. Don't let them put you to sleep. He has no mercy. And no equal. Now no one sleeps. Get ready. This August, your wildest dreams will come true. How sweet, fresh meat. A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4 The Dream Master By 1988, Kristen, played by Tuesday Night (laughs) I hate that Looking very, very different has been released from Weston Hills and is attending high school like a normal girl with her asylum friends Joey and Kincaid, looking quite similar to their days in the hospital. She lives in fear that Freddy Krueger will once again resurrect to haunt her dreams. When she dreams that she is in Freddy's boiler room, she summons Joey and Kincaid into her dream, and they're all like, stop doing that, ho, Freddy's dead. But is he? Kristen has other normal friends at school, too. Her boyfriend, Rick, a martial arts enthusiast, his sister Alice, played by Lisa Wilcox, a shy girl with a penchant for daydreaming, Lisa Turtle, uh, Sheila, an asthmatic nerd, and Debbie, a girl who hates bugs. (laughs) Debbie. (laughs) Joey and Kincaid confront Kristen about her big, stinky dream and warn her that she may bring Freddy back if she's not careful. That night, Kincaid dreams that he's in the car graveyard in Freddy's burial site. His dog, Jason, is there too. However, there's something seriously wrong with that dog's urinary tract because he pees fire on Freddy's grave and boom! That's when Turkey came back. (laughs) Sorry, that's what it takes to bring the Nightmare Killer back. Kincaid's dream strength can't save him this time, though, and he's killed. 
Meanwhile, Joey, horny as always, dreams that a naked woman is in his waterbed. And by surprise, it's Freddy! He drowns him by encasing him in his own bed. The next morning, Kristen learns of their deaths, but no one seems to be talking about how Joey got trapped in a water mattress. She tells Rick, Alice, and Alice's crush Dan, played by Danny Hassel, about Kruger and vows to avenge her friends. She gets her chance when her mom puts sleeping pills in her dinner. She's the last of the kids that Freddy needs to kill, but Kristen just can't not use her power and pulls Alice into the dream, giving Freddy fresh fodder for murder. As she dies, Kristen somehow gives her dream pulling in into power to Alice. When Alice awakens, she senses that something's amiss, and she makes Rick take her to Kristen's house, where her room is on fire. Although her mom doesn't seem to realize it. Rip, Elm Street kids. The next day, Alice falls asleep in math class, and the dumb bitch pulls Sheila into her dream. With a seriously gross kiss, Freddy sucks all the air out of her body, making it look like Sheila had a lethal asthma attack. Thankfully, Alice picks up a device that Sheila made to scare bugs away from Debbie, randomly. Rick begins to believe Alice has crazy Kruger talk, but he doesn't get to help much because he dreams that an invisible Freddy is attacking him in his kick-ass dream dojo. He summons all of his karate kidness to the fight, but it's no use. His kicks are no match for a levitating glove that stabs him to death. Alice notices that she gains a little bit of each dead friend, Kristen's dream pulling into power, Sheila's smarts, and Rick's questionable martial arts skills. But what does Debbie have to offer? She likes to work out, apparently, and Alice pulls her into a dream while doing so, giving Freddy the perfect opportunity to transform Debbie into her mortal enemy, a cockroach. Debbie's arms break and thud to the floor, replaced by giant muppety roach legs. She is then trapped in a roach motel, where she falls and rips off her face in stick glue. Mostly roach at this point, Debbie roach screams that Freddy squishes her to roach death. <laughs> Alice and Dan race to save Debbie, but are stuck in a dream loop. As Debbie dies, she graces Alice with her temper. She tries to run over Freddy with Dan's truck, but in reality hits a tree and injures Dan, who's taken to the hospital and prepped for surgery. Finally confident, Alice readies herself for the final showdown. Armed with Debbie's temper, Rick's kung fu's, and Sheila's bug weapon, she joins Dan in his surgery dream. They find themselves in an old church, but Dan is injured, causing his surgeons to wake him up. Alone, Alice battles Freddy. Freddy has the upper glo- <coughs> Freddy has the upper gloved hand, but Alice has her newfound dream powers, which don't seem to do her very good at all. Just when it seems Freddy will win, she remembers the Dream Master nursery rhyme, also known as everyone's childhood prayer, that she's been talking about the whole movie. She forces Freddy to gaze upon his own reflection, causing his precious souls to revolt. They pop out of his body and rip him apart. The souls of Alice's friends and the others who came before them wisp away, thanking her and leaving Freddy a hollow husk of what he once was. Sometime later, Dan has recovered and is now dating Alice. They pass a fountain in which Dan tosses a coin and tells Alice to make a wish. She sees Freddy's image in the water but dismisses it. As they walk away, Dan asks what she wished for. She doesn't tell him, starting a long line of communication problems in their relationship. The end. (laughs) (laughs) That pretty much sums it up. (laughs) Love it. Dream Master was released on August 19th, 1988 on more than 1,700 screens. The film would gross almost $13 million opening weekend, securing the number one spot at the box office. Other movies in the top 10 that weekend included Young Guns, Die Hard, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. The movie would hold the number one spot for three weeks and remain in the top 10 for a total of six. Ultimately, it would gross $49.3 million against a budget of only $6.5 million. It would remain the highest grossing movie of the franchise until the release... A Freddy vs. Jason. Dream Master holds a 53% on Rotten Tomato. Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes. Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes. Don't you know? Dream Master holds a 53% on Rotten Tomatoes with an audience score at 43%. 
The site's consensus reads, A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, marks a relatively high point in this franchise's bumpy creative journey, although the original remains far superior. Metacritic gives the film a 56, indicating mixed or average reviews. This is a high point? <laughs> now a high point? <laughs> Upon its release, critic Kevin Thomas of the Los Angeles Times praised the storyline, performances, and special effects, stating that the film is, quote, by far the best of the series, a superior horror picture that balances wit with gore, with imagination and intelligence. It very effectively mirrors the anxieties of the teenage audience for which it's primarily intended, end quote. Jesus. Thomas then went on to commend Wilcox's portrayal of Alex, stating, quote, It matters not to Freddy that these kids' parents had nothing to do with his torching. In essence, however, the film is about how a shy, lovely teenager named Alice, played by Lisa Wilcox, with a widowed alcoholic father, gradually gathers the courage to assert herself in taking on Freddy, and in the process, wins the love of the handsomest boy, played by Danny Hessel, and her school. If the nightmare sequences are impressive with their inferno-like images, the film's young cast is no less so. Nightmare 4 provides Wilcox with an exceptionally challenging screen debut, end quote. Jesus Christ. Yeah. This guy is sucking the dick of this movie. For real. Yeah, she's um, sucking the dick for free. That was kind of the only review that I could find that was, like, contemporary to put in. So, I went to Letterboxd. A two-star review on Letterboxd writes, This is the entry where the adults stop giving a shit about all these dead kids. And a 3.5-star review on Letterboxd adds, I want to suck face with the Urkel glasses girl. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Here, here. Me too. <laughs> Hashtag me too. Also, I kind of agree with the Letterboxd review. Where the adults stop giving shit about all the dead kids? Well, I feel like they kind of started in, you know, movie one. <laughs> but um, that's kind of been a theme, you know, and something that interestingly kind of happens in, on uh, It Follows, right? Mm -hmm. Which are kind of like modern commentaries on, I would say, this series in particular. Yeah, but I would say that in Dream Warriors, at least like the, Nancy the adults wasn't were never a, even shown. They don't even show their faces. Though that's it's Charlie true. Brown. It's it's all kids in that movie. Yeah, but in the one prior to this, like there were there were two adults that really did care about the kids. You know, like they were they wanted them not to die actively, which I think is something that's missing from the rest of the franchise, especially this one. Well, I think like one thing that Wes Craven did a little bit better, starting with like um, Scream, was like the school shut down and there was a big police presence and everything like that. These kids are dying like flies in these movies you know yep. dropping like flies and uh there's like dozens now are dead and there's like no one talking about it these parents have never gotten back together or had some sort of like i don't know hooded mass meeting at midnight somewhere <laughs> I know. like maybe we shouldn't have done what we did i don't know there's just never <clears throat> about that and uh if you're gonna have the parents be a big part of the story freddie has nothing to do with them in a way and they'll have nothing to do with these murders it's like they just the the recurring theme of all of these parents is like non-belief and apathy. Yeah. And it's like, it doesn't really fit the story to me. No, it doesn't. Right. And I mean, like if anything, they cared too much, you know, if, if anything in this as well, like the way that they are shown to be dead in real life is it's fantastical. Right. Because I mean, it's a horror movie, but there's a kid whose mom finds him encased in a fucking water bed. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't happen. That can't happen. And all she does is like scream. They they never even like mention nope. that. I mean, and I can suspend my disbelief for a little bit, you know. Well, actually, a lot of it. Well, Wes Craven, I, I guess, actually, in the first film, does have a police presence, and they're asking questions, and they don't believe it, and like how yeah. it's done, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, they don't they don't really do that again. No, they don't. And in this one, it is literally just a whole bunch of kids dying, and no one questioning whatsoever. Yeah, which is completely different from the one that came just prior. Yeah. Agreed. It does have some accolades. Um, at the Razzies, it was nominated for the Worst Original Song by Therapist. And at the Saturn Awards in 1990, so I guess they were doing it every other year, uh, it was nominated for Best Supporting Actor, Robert England, who lost to Robert Loja from Big, uh, Best Director, but lost to Robert Zemeckis for Roger Rabbit, and Best Horror Film, but that lost to Beetlejuice. Why not? Sure. I can't imagine this movie winning really anything. It was nominated for all those things. Oh. So we have a cast... Yes, we do. Uh, obviously, Robert England is back as Freddy Krueger, and he's never really been replaced, no. except for that one movie, except for the remake. That's it. Yeah. That's it. He's always done it, and he 
he should he should have been in that remake too you know i mean maybe that would have defeated the purpose but yeah i think so i thought that guy did a good job though yeah it's just like the, the the tone of the movie was wrong yeah i mean there's some things wrong in that movie and maybe at some point on patreon we'll get to that right but or maybe not. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like Robert England at, at this point is really coming into his own as Freddy Krueger. Like, I'm sure that we'll talk about, like, some of the commercial success of this movie and the way that it was marketed and the way that Freddy Krueger was starting to be, like, just, like, really marketed toward children a lot with the start of this particular movie, I yeah. feel. Because I remember all that marketing. This is Starting at this point, I have seen all the Nightmare on Elm in the theater. Four was the first one I saw in the theater, and I saw them all. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we also have uh, Ruby Tuesday or whatever the fuck. Um, Tuesday night. <laughs> Tuesday night. Tonight. As Kristen Parker, who took over the role for Patricia Arquette. She also, uh, Tuesday night, <laughs> would contribute to the film soundtrack. And in 2010's documentary Never Sleep Again, other cast members suggest that her prominence was a result of a relationship with director Rini Harlan. Oh. Something both Harlan and Knight deny to this day. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So we'll have more about that a little bit later. I do like the soundtrack to this movie, though. Yeah, there's a lot about the soundtrack. Uh, the soundtrack is beloved, and there's about twice as many songs in the movie as there is in the soundtrack. That's right. I mean, I just, just I look like it for yeah. the fucking Sinead O'Connor song. So yeah, it needs to like like touch my body or something. Yeah, it is. hands on my body. Like, hands yeah. on my yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a good soundtrack. Check it out. <laughs> 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 moving on uh lisa wilcox as alice johnson so like this movie part of it part of its problem to me is like the connected tissue it suffers like an aliens to alien 3 problem okay. where it's just like new cast exactly you know they did they just, like they did not as much as they could have based on my complaint from the last movie um but they spent a lot of time kind of building up this group and having them live through something together and then like the first thing they do is make them into assholes the survivors of that group into assholes recast the main and then kill them off yep right so you know fuck you (laughs) well i feel like at this point like patricia arquette was probably moving on to bigger things yeah like clearly like true romance was coming out really quickly she didn't want to get typecast she didn't have a problem with horror but she did not also want to be typecast in horror movies or become a scream queen she had a big problem with that apparently even though it hasn't really hurt it never hurt anyone no didn't hurt sigourney and, I mean, Patricia Arquette would go on to do a lot of genre work. And Jamie so. Lee Curtis uh, literally just won an Oscar, so. That's true. So, Patricia, you could have come back and done this. You were going to be in four scenes. Well, there was a thing with her brother, but. <laughs> <laughs> David? Yeah, he's only good for screen movies, and then they killed him off of that. And then they took that away. <laughs> Justice for the Arquettes. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I feel like Lisa Wilcox was fine in this movie. You know what I mean? Like, I, <laughs> so was Tuesday night. And so, and so was Tuesday night, really. I mean, like, they were all, like, fine, I guess. But, like... I actually enjoyed Lisa Wilcox in this movie. And it. I thought the... the Really, I, I really did think that the primary um, heroine and, you know, a protagonist in this movie was going to be Kristen Parker's character, you know, played by Tuesday night, which was Patricia Arquette's character, right? Yeah. She was like the dream puller or whatever. And um, I thought it was going to follow her story, but it kills her off pretty quickly. I feel like they they sort of box themselves in a little bit or push themselves against a wall with the plot yeah. device of him seeking revenge on the people who murdered him, right? Or sought some sort of visualizing justice against him. Yeah, he's running out of kids. That's right. On Elm Street. He's got, he's got three kids left of the families who did this sort of thing. And, you know, you... you you can't have any more movies once he kills those three off, right? So they have to have some sort of way to do it. And this was the way. And if every kid has two parents, you got to wonder what that fucking like lynch mob was like. It was like 300 people or something. <laughs> That's right. At this point, <laughs> I mean, my God. So I mean, they, they had to, they had to do that. They had to kill them off. Right. I just feel like it happened really, really quickly and kind of unceremoniously. And I just didn't really like the way that they had become. I mean, like you said, like they were kind of assholes to Kristen, Joey and Kincaid. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's the stupid trope where they don't believe you. Yeah. And these are the kids that like live through it with her. And so it throws away all of that credibility in the first five minutes of this fucking movie. I mean, when you live through something as crazy as that, the last thing you want to do is just be like, I just want to forget it, you know? And yeah, there could be a part of that, 
You know, it's supposed to happen like one year after the events of Dream Warriors. But like, my God, you should have formed a bond enough at least to like not get mad at someone when they're scared and turning to you for help. Right. That's what people do. That's what survivors do. That's what support groups do. And they spent a whole movie trying to create a group and then just like turned them against each other and then killed them off in like 15 minutes. Yep. So. Dumb, dumb. Yeah. Who else we got? Uh, We got. Endress Jones is Rick Johnson, who uh, plays Alice's brother and the boyfriend of Kristen. Um, you would later recall being stalemated by the rest of the cast after shooting had completed and hinted at a possible conflict with director Rennie Harlan. I somehow feel like Rennie Harlan is either very, very liked or very, very hated on this set and maybe all of them. Stalemated? What? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what that means, really. Does that mean like... Um, I wonder if that means um, Stonewalled, what they really mean. Oh, yeah, like shunned? Yeah, shunned. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Maybe better. I wonder why. Stalemated. That's a weird way to put that. Yeah. Um, He was good. You know what I mean? I thought he was great. He I, was, thought, I thought he was one of the most compelling characters in the whole thing because he was actually – it also reminded me of Heathers a little bit, like a good version of that character. You yeah, know I mean? he was really trying his hardest to be Christian Slater in this movie. Which movie came first? Uh. Yeah, Heather's came out after this, I believe. There or maybe go. around the same year, you know? Interesting. Huh. But he was, this guy wasn't trying to be, you know, Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson? No, he was trying to be Christian Slater. Yeah. But there was just like some mannerisms and, and really the way that he looked. I was just like, wow, this is Heather's. I'm like, all to a T. We also got Danny Hassel as Dan Jordan. Uh, Hassel wasn't expecting to be cast and assumed that the producers giving his character the same name as himself meant that they were not that interested in his role or the script. Nonetheless, Hassel, along with Wilcox, would return in the sequel the following year. That's right. As the father. Of the dream dream child. child. Yeah. (laughs) Who's the daddy? Yeah, and this is most people's hottest guy, but it's not mine. Oh, shit. Is it mine? It's Lawrence Fishburne from the last movie. I know. We're going backward. <laughs> Stay tuned, listeners, for but that. But so is this franchise. <laughs> Backwards in ratings. Uh, Ken Sagoas returned as, as Roland Kincaid. Obviously, Sagoas returned from the previous film, although he recalled in 20, uh, 2010 telling his friends not to buy any popcorn. He goes straight into the film as his on-screen presence was minimal. I mean, he does have a pivotal kind of role in this because like he's the kind of he's he's the reason that Freddy Krueger comes back. Right. Because he went to Kristen. He was like, Freddy's dead. There's nothing to worry about. Stop pulling me into your dreams. Then he has his own fucking dream and his dog pisses Freddy back to life. Yeah. Which I still don't really understand. I think that was they were trying to say it was like a hell, a hellhound. Yeah. Right. But I wanted to think that it was Freddy like possessing an animal because that's all he could do at his state. Possibly. Right. So all he needed someone to do was dig up his bones. You know? Or maybe it's just like that general like junkyard just makes animals. But Rennie Harlan was like, it's a hellhound. I'm like, then why is it the fucking du-? Okay, whatever. Dumb yeah. Shit. Anyway, he peed fire. Yeah. This so. guy made Cutthroat Island. So that's all I want to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I assume we're going to be talking about Rennie Harlan. We Island are. And I actually kind of like his stuff sometimes. Yeah. I, do. I don't think it's terrible. I he can't. makes popcorn movies yeah and i don't know and plus we have to keep in mind that it's never a single person that's responsible for the vision and the pulling off of a movie you know what i mean exactly um he is not a writer right and so he's a director and a competent technical director especially later on um certainly not really with this one Mm. you know but anyway as soon as that dog peed fire i was just like because i okay because we're going to get into this movie now right we've talked about everything in the cast so um I really, really enjoy the Nightmare on Elm franchise, which I have said throughout these entire discussions. Oh, <laughs> I know. How shocking for everybody. But there are a couple that I just haven't seen all that much. Right. And this is one of them. Like, I've seen it a couple times when I was younger and I stopped watching it. I kind of skip over it. And I couldn't remember why, really. Until I started watching it on this particular rewatch. Because it's kind of boring? It's not boring, really. I mean, like, it moves really quickly. It does, but it doesn't, hold, like, it's none of it's memorable. Like, Some of it's just really silly to me. And not even silly enough to laugh at, though. Right. And that's the difference. It's I mean, we beige. Were, it's super fucking beige. We were just watching Predator 2 and, like, making fun of the movie and having a good time watching it. And, like, that affected my rating on that movie. I was like, I had a good time watching it. And this one, I was just like, now what? Like, literally, when that dog 
pissed fire on the ground. I was like, what is this Thanksgiving? Yeah, I was just like, I don't even know what's going on right now. So, I mean, I had a gummy, thankfully. It's never explained. And as we get into the movie a little bit, I mean, like, it kind of saves itself from just being completely abysmal. But, I mean, those moments happen too late. But, anyway... Let's get into it. Yeah. So franchise originator Wes Craven presented his own pitch for the fourth Elm Street film, but producers Sarah Risher and Robert Shea turned it down. Instead, going with Dream Master pitch as a progression of the Dream Warriors concept from the previous film. Risher explained that, quote, initially, I approached Wes for an idea for the fourth film. I always go to Wes first each time. His idea was illogical. It was about time travel within dreams that broke all of the rules of the dreams. We decided not to go with that. When we decided to go with William Kotswinkel's Dream Master idea, which we thought was terrific, I told Wes we were doing that. Wow. <laughs> You're doing your best Catherine right now. <laughs> kind of. Not, not really. Like early Catherine. Yeah. Not... Pre mid Atlantic accent roll away, you know? <laughs> um, so, why in the world. Are there rules in dreams that can be broken? I feel like dreams have no rules, and I feel like this franchise proves that every single time there's a dream. I'm trying to say it's like concurrent with time, I think, right? It's always the present is, okay. is the dreams. But I, I mean, I guess that's true. I think that's dumb, actually, in a way. I mean, if you're going to have dreams and just go like far into fantasy with this, like go far into fantasy with it, I would have to know what his idea was more fully than this. But dream. Dream, 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 dream. Okay. Shay felt that Graven and the Dead did not have the impact the producers were looking for. Graven and his writing partner, Bruce Wagner, were later contacted about doing rewrites for the script, but they turned it down uh, as Craven felt that they should have been approached the first time around as artists of the original fucking material. Probably. But they didn't. They didn't, Blanche. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not, Blanche. You're not writing that script. Eventually, the director's work was given to Finnish born Renny Harlan, who had previously directed only two low budget features uh, a Finnish action film called Born American in 1986 and the American horror film Prison in 1987. Have you seen that one? I have. I like Prison quite a bit. After Dream Master, he would go on to direct movies like Die Hard 2, Cliffhanger, Cutthroat Island. This begins his marriage in collaboration with Gina Davis, mm -hmm. who would go on to do, after that box office bomb, The Long Kiss Goodnight, which is one of my favorite action movies ever. And I've only seen it the one time with you after a very long time you trying to get me to watch it. And I also enjoyed the fuck out of that movie. It's a movie. Christmas movie. It's so good. It is a Christmas movie. Let me just see it. This Christmas again. It's been like five years since we watched it. I'm ready to watch it again. Yeah. Deep Blue Sea. Which has one of the best jump scare moments in all of film just because of how fucking hilarious and shocking it was. I remember seeing that in the theater. I love Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> I mean, like, this guy's filmography is... I've seen these movies. I liked a lot of these movies. So, what else has he done? Exorcist the Beginning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. The Covenant. Uh, Yay! I mean, that <laughs> has a lot of fucking eye candy in it. And I'm it's starting to see a theme super here. Super gay. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, now, this just in, folks, an untitled third The Strangers film. So I heard that they are rebooting The Strangers. So it's not, it's kind of like a, a retcon, maybe, or just like a, a redux of that movie. By Renny Harlan? By Renny Harlan. Are we sure that Renny Harlan isn't just one of those director's names that people take when they're too embarrassed of their film? <laughs> like a, a Smithy film? An yes. Alan Smithy? A Renny Harlan film. <laughs> but is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> okay. Rennie Harlan. Prison is not, it's not, a, it's not a good movie. You know what I mean? But it's, it's very, very eighties and it's, it's fun. You know what I mean? In ways that this movie is too. Like, I, I think this movie has some fun parts to it and I can see why they would have picked him after like making a movie like prison, but he would go on to do some really, really big budget stuff. Yeah. Right. And, but I think that out of all of his filmography, the things that are really, really good, people don't pay attention to they always go back to cutthroat island because that movie lost a shit ton of money and it wasn't even a bad movie really i mean i watched it when i was a kid it just wasn't my thing you know i watched it on on direct tv whenever it came out i didn't even see it in the theater yeah i think um, i watched it on video i watched it you know i remember um my sister and i were like like yelling at the tv because it was so exciting when we were young 
but that was a huge, huge budget. It was, and it was, you could see it. Yeah. And I thought it was, I thought it was good when I was, I, I've never felt the compulsion to see it again after I was like 12 or 13 or whatever. But <laughs> I mean, like some of these movies are really good. Like Deep Blue Sea, I think is, a, is an enjoyable fucking shark movie. Only like, for one fucking moment. I, I, I like Deep Blue Sea. I think it's good. I'm not, I won't, I won't knock it. I've seen it a couple times. I have a good time every time but I watch it. But The Long Kiss Goodnight is his best film there. I said it. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is a very, very good movie. And Gina Davis is excellent in that. I fucking love her in that. The Exorcist well, the Beginning. Samuel Jackson in that. Better than Deep Blue Sea. Yeah. Uh, Exorcist the Beginning, we have already talked about on Patreon. My God, yes, we have. Uh-huh. The so, Covenant, we just watched in our own time, I guess, because we never released anything on it. Yeah, we? well, we keep putting it on polls, and then it never wins. <laughs> and so, so we had to watch it ourselves. And I had never seen it, and so we're like, watch it. I totally forgot that he directed that movie. Me too. So, I knew we talked about Rennie Harlan before I just forgot. I just forgot if it was something that we talked about on the show or not. Oh my gosh. Is that happening to us now? Yeah. Are we that old? Well, we, just, we can't separate podcast life from like, it is our life. Our podcast life is, we were just recording our conversations. That was the whole point from the beginning. That's true. God this, damn it. This is what it would be like anyway. But now we're watching things like the covenant and we're like, did so we talk about that or actually this is the beginning? I don't come to talk to you with like a prepared document. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you should. You're like, Robert, sit down. Let me get my iPad. <laughs> we have some things to talk about. I've bullet pointed them. <laughs> I really don't want him to direct any Strangers movies. In fact, I don't want there to be any more Strangers movies. Like, I no, the first one was all we needed, really. Yeah. And the second one is, is I, you know, but like, I, stop, stop making these movies. <sighs> Rennie. If anyone comes to do that, I want it to be the guy that did the original Strangers, right? Who did the, the Dark and the Wicked. Yeah. Bertano. Yeah, fuck man, he's such good. He makes good scary movies. That movie's frightening, and they're ruining some it. Some of the scariest movies I've ever seen by that director. Mm-hmm. Another being ruined. No one knows a tone quite like him these days. Not Rennie, good old Rennie. Yeah. Anyway, Harlan <laughs> felt that Freddie had become the James Bond of the series, the one the audience roots for, saying, "Quote: We've reached a point where the audience sees Freddie as the hero. They come to these movies." to hear funny lines and see him do these amazing things. And because of that popularity, I'm faced with showing Freddie in a more heroic light and giving him more screen time. People will still fear him, but they will also be cheering him on. Cheering on Freddie feels so good in a place like this. <laughs> I love how you took a finish Rennie Harlan and made him sound a little bit like Keanu Reeves <laughs> just then. Like I'm really digging the voice. I was doing a Finnish accent. <laughs> 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 Freddie did jump into popularity. It's the opposite of highfalutin. <laughs> Lowfalutin. <laughs> Lowfalutin. Mm. Can, can we make that t shirt? It's too easy. Low fiduce me. <laughs> fiduce me. <laughs> it's quite roll off the tongue. Uh, I remember when this movie was coming out and the way that it was marketed because I spent a lot of time watching TV and movies when I was like seven, eight, nine, ten years old, maybe for the rest of my life. But uh, Freddy Krueger was all over the fucking place right around this time because that's when the TV series had come out. I remember there being a 1-900 number that you could call and talk to Freddy Krueger or listen to See, Freddy Krueger. I thought Kruger. it had kind of come out around Dream Math or uh, Dream Warriors. No, it came out after. Really? So it was like right around the same time that this is coming. And I can't remember. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of it had to do with this movie being made and coming out and like just like coming off the popularity of Dream Warriors and making all that money. And New Line being, you know, kind of a, a company that's now producing and making movies and not just distributing things. So a, a lot of it had, you know, to to play a part in that. But Freddy Krueger was starting to get marketed to kids like really, really heavily to a point to where like there's toys, dolls, stuffed animals and things like that. Like I really wanted all of these things because I was obsessed with Freddy Krueger when I was younger. I'm sure like a lot of kids were. Hmm. And so he's right. I mean, like the, the most natural thing to do at this point would be to give him more screen time and to show him more and give him all these quippy lines because that's what happens for the rest of this franchise. Yeah, but it's also a mistake in my in I mean, my I would agree with We've you. We've talked about this a lot lately with like yeah. Predator and in the other series. When you just you just go over and it's a one trick, you know, horse the entire time. Mm-hmm. You know, then there's just not much there. Well, that I mean, and you take something that was like truly frightening, and at least in the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Right. And then you turn him into this like comedic villain 
to where it's no longer scary. Yeah, there are some gross out moments for the rest of this franchise, but nothing, nothing is really scary anymore. There are a lot of things they could do with sleep itself, not just dreams, right? Um, You know, a lot of people are talking about sleep paralysis and stuff like that. And uh, that stuff existed back then, obviously. So I feel like they just like they missed some opportunities to try and reinvent Freddy in new and interesting ways, you know, um, and he could still have that kind of campy humor about him. But sure. if you just make it over just a bunch of set pieces around Freddy, you know, you basically make it into Freddy's Funhouse. like three movies over, you know, you're just making schlock to get money yeah. and it doesn't feel like you actually feel passionate about it. They had the perfect opportunity in this movie because they really set Alice's character up as a daydreamer. And I'm like, they're, they're like actively filming these like daydream sequences. And I was like, that's technically dreaming. It's technically sleep. Like he can come into that sort of thing and they never play with that at all. Yeah. Like she's actively dreaming when all these things happen and they just like, just drop the whole daydream subplot when they could have just tried something new. But I mean, what, 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 indeed. So back to the casting a little bit, um, you know, we talked about Patricia Arquette not coming back and, you know, ultimately being filled by Tuesday night. <laughs> God, uh, over 600 actresses auditioned for the role of Alice, which was eventually given to obviously Lisa Wilcox. She had previously auditioned for a role in the previous film Dream Warriors, but failed uh, to land it. Uh, and in Never Sleep Again, the Elm Street legacy documentary director, Har- Rennie Harlan describes that he and the producers were looking for, quote, somebody he could make seem timid and vulnerable in the beginning and who could then, in a believable way, become kind of like Sigourney Weaver in Aliens or something like that. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> for real. Lisa Wilcox was initially passed over because she looked too much like a cheerleader. Oh. And she said, quote, I basically whimped myself out. I wore no makeup, wore my worst color, which is yellow, and just showed up looking like hell. Their reaction was, is that Lisa Wilcox? After they got over their shock, they gave me the role. Because she does, actually. She goes through this um, very, you know, Sarah Plain and Tall kind of, like, situation. Mm -hmm. And slowly over the movie, she's getting more and more makeup by the end. She looks like a goddamn supermodel. Yep. You know, and it's supposed to, like, kind of give us visual communication, visual storytelling of her confidence, you know. Which is kind of tired in a way, but it's also kind of impressive to see at the same time. I mean, like she, she, like I said, she's fine in this movie. Like she, I have no problems with her whatsoever. And I have no problems with the character at all. I kind of like the character of Alex, both of Alex. I liked the message, but like, it just reminded me of the, the silly character. She reminds me so much of the seri- of the silly character from scary movie series. Anna, Anna Ferris. Anna Ferris's character. Yeah. Yeah. She kind of looks like that. But I mean, like, it's the things that happen to her character, Alice, is what I meant to say. Um, it's it's not her fault, really. It's kind of script. The script is kind of trite, you know? Like, every time she pulls off pictures from her mirror, which was completely covered to where she can see herself by the end of it. You know what yeah, I mean? I'm just point. like, okay, like, we get it, you know? Like, you don't have to explain everything. We can see that she's gaining more confidence and becoming stronger. And a lot of it... They say it's because she's getting these personality traits from her dead friends. But it also wasn't visual storytelling alone because like her brother is like, you know, you can't see yourself in the mirror. And she's like, I like it like that or whatever. And it's like, okay, yeah, you can stop hanging the lantern on it. It's already really fucking obvious. Ready? Well, I mean, a lot of this movie is obvious. I mean, like how many times do they say like every time someone dies, she gets a piece of their personality or some of their ability. You know what I mean? And when it, it would have been be collecting souls, it would have been a lot more. Oh my God, you're right. She's eating on that fucking soul pizza. Does she get like finger knives now that she killed Freddy? Like, what? God, I wish. I mean, but like you really could just say that like going through traumatic experiences is making you a stronger person. Blah, 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 blah. That's that's much better and way more interesting than like now I'm a little bit smarter because Urkel died or whatever. And, you know, and now I can like, I'm kind of good at martial arts because my brother was kind of good at martial arts. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I would rather see a character like pick those things up on her own. You know, like I miss my brother. I felt something traumatic. I'm going to start studying martial arts. Yeah, give us the goddamn 80s training montage. We got that montage in that movie, oh, God, though. Right. When she's getting ready to go for the final showdown, you know, she's like. 
I know. I was just about to sing final countdown. <laughs> da, 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 da. I mean, she's like da, da, da. getting ready. She's like getting dressed and she's tying on her brother's like bandana and she's getting that device and, you know, finally looking into the mirror. And I was just like, I love a montage. Like, really, I do. And this one doesn't disappoint, but. Except that I loved James Cameron's like, fuck you montage better because it's all live. It's not a montage. When Sigourney Weaver is just like, you know, duct taping her guns together and like it's this long one shot Uh of her in an elevator. Come on. He like destroyed all montages, uh, getting ready to fight montages with that one scene for all time. Well, this one is like classically 80s, though. I mean, I feel like every 80s movie has one of these fucking montages in it for sure. (laughs) The final countdown. So the creative process was actually bogged down by the untimely 1988 Writers Guild of America strike. Oh, shit. Running from March 7th to August 7th. So a full six months. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1988, forcing Rennie Harlan and the producers to improvise much during the filming. Lisa Wilcox and Andres Jones wrote their own dialogue for Alice and Rick after the death of Kristen while watching their old home videos, such as I Saw It Happen in My Dream. Oh. Many of the nightmare scenes were made up from ideas that Harlan came up with rather than from the writer's script because they couldn't use shit. So okay. half of this movie. <laughs> well, I think this kind of explains everything. It does in a way, actually. Okay. Well, I guess it all makes sense now. I did not know this. Yeah, but was something was written before. That, that doesn't make sense to me. If it's written before and they want to do rewrites, like... You stick to what's done. Stick to what's already available. Or you use someone that's not in the guild i guess or someone who's willing to cross the line i guess i don't know but like why did they have to do all that well i mean i think it's pretty obvious that there were there's something going on with this script it, it, i feel like i feel like this movie feels a little disjointed at parts and i feel like there's there's not a whole lot of story aside from people dying and yet, and yet they said no to wes craven and his writing partner mm-hmm. and went with this <laughs> Well, God knows what the script was like before the rewrites or what they wanted to do, right? If they're having people improvise things, they're like, well, we want to change it, but we can't have any writers. So y'all just go and do something and we'll film it, you know? Eek. But I mean, like we just got through talking about a montage and I feel like this entire movie is kind of a montage. It's just like jumping from one death to another. And that happens a lot in slasher movies. Sure. But like, there's usually some connective story in between and this one has it, but it's kind of thin. So, yeah, I don't know. So uh, let's talk about the look and feel a little bit. Look, meh. Feel, meh. The score was composed by Craig Safan, who did The Last Starfighter and this TV show, Cheers. (laughs) That's about it. (laughs) It's random. I will say, like, as this movie goes on, it gets pretty fucking creative with its gore and its kills, right? Something that will continue in the franchise a little bit, you know? I mean, like, there are some moments in this that I think they're actively gross. Like, that fucking soul pizza, right? Yeah. Where, like, there's, like, meatball heads and he skewers one and eats it. There are some cool ideas, like the the pizza, and, of course, the soul chest makes its way back, and uh, there's that cockroach scene. Which is really fucking fucking gnarly. Gross. And then the waterbed scene actually thought was really cool. I mean, I I do like that scene too because I mean, I mean it looks very simple, but I mean it looked real and good. Yeah. like it was done, you know, really really well, and uh, I I loved that. But um, it's all kind of ultimately forgettable. None of it's better than the creativity or imagination seen in the film before it with Dream Warriors. That's true. Uh, or even any of the horror from the first one or even two movies. And so it's like when you've watered down the intrigue and the creativity. And the horror and everything else, all you have left is Freddy and his one-liners and some ick moments. I mean, but some of the ick moments, though. I mean, so like I was watching this and I remembered that fucking cockroach scene, but I I pretty much just remembered the arms, you know, like the big yeah. gangly Muppety arms. And she's stuck in the Roach Motel and she's like, ah, you know, like flailing about. And, and then when she, <laughs> when she falls on her face and gets her face stuck in that Roach Motel glue... I was just like, okay, I remember, right? And my stomach started to churn a little bit because I knew what was going to happen. And she pulls herself up and her face is coming off her body. And I was just like, that's fucking gross. 
And I was just like, oh, good God. head underneath. Right. You know, but like it's the fucking skin coming off of it stuck in that glue. Like, I don't, it's just one of those moments where you can like feel it. Like we just talked about that kid's veins coming out. Right. And being puppeteered. Yeah. And I could like, you can sort of like. It's just one of those visceral moments. It is. You can hear it. The one that just instantly came to mind was um, the Robocop. When the guy um, is covered in like the toxic waste or whatever, and yeah. Robocop's car ring, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> runs him over and is so fucking gross. <laughs> it's all practical effect, too. I mean, and this was too, you know? And so, I mean, like, I, I don't know. There, there there are moments in this. I mean, even the end when like the souls are coming out of Freddy's body, it kind of looks Muppety, but it's neat having an arm coming out and like pulling his own head off and shit like that. I mean, by the time this movie was ending, I feel like they spent most of their time and most of their money creating those effects in this mirror. Yeah, the way he that he died, yeah, did it. yeah. How, how he just came out. to life in this movie, and then how he died was equally as dumb yes. and unimaginative. I mean, it really is. I mean, like at this point, they're just like, okay, we've killed everyone off. Now we have to kill off Freddy and start sitting down to maybe write about the, you know the next sequel or whatever. And so, like, they were talking about this rhyme in the movie, the whole fucking movie. And she seems to have forgotten that by the end of it. She was, like, sort of, like, maybe because she found all her confidence. I can do this. And she's like, no, I have to go back to one more thing to remember. And that's what it was. But, yeah, seeing a reflection killing him, like, I feel like Freddie would be like, I look good, you know? He's all out of one-liners when it's time for him to die or look at himself. And I'm like, that it doesn't seem to do some, it doesn't do the villain justice to kill him that way. Plus, he's seen mirrors before. I mean, it's all over um, uh, Nightmare on Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. And Dream Warriors, for sure, because there's a whole hall of mirrors. Yeah. But um, yeah, so it's an unceremonious death, just like the original Elm Street kids in the beginning of this movie, and kind of a cop out, but. I mean, at this point, they were just looking for a way to move on to the next movie, which yeah. which they do with the two survivors from this one. Well, do you have some fun fact for me? <laughs> <laughs> I do, actually. I have a bunch of fun fact. Okay. So, the first film in the franchise, this is the first film in the franchise where Robert England received top billing in the opening credits. He certainly did, and on the poster and everything else. And the name of the diner where Alice works is called The Crave Inn. <laughs> a reference to franchise creator Wes Craven. I get it. Yeah. Welcome to the Craven. <sighs> according according to the Never Sleep Again documentary, producer Rachel Talele recounted a meeting between director Rennie Harlan and James Cameron. Again, James Cameron keeps popping up in these other movies. He just knows everybody. Cameron in- inquired how Freddy was being resurrected for this film, in which Harlan replied, a dog pisses fire. <laughs> yeah, I mean, shows how passionate he is about this story. Sometimes you just know. Sometimes it's all it well, takes. passionate enough because Rennie Harlan got the job by refusing to take no for an answer, rather than accept the rejection. He instead showed up. He was rejected several times. <laughs> instead, he showed up the New Line Cinema offices on a daily basis, repeatedly requesting to speak with producer Robert Che. For a variety of reasons, they didn't like any of the other directors who came in for meetings about the movie, and Harlan always seemed to be around. Eventually, his persistence won the day to some degree because he was so clearly impoverished that his clothes never seemed to change day to day and even began to smell. They had to hire him just so he could afford some new clothes or so Bob Shea jokes. Bob Shea's in this movie, too. Yeah, a little clip. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. Little cameo. Rennie Harlan showing up stinky and shit. How bohemian of him. Mm. Where is he now? During filming, several of the main actors on set were turned off by their co-star, actress Tuesday Night, and director Rennie Harlan's rumored romantic fling, which ultimately resulted in Knight being pampered by Harlan and giving special attention while the other actors were tossed aside by crew members. The rumor of their relationship on and off set was talked about so much that when the documentary Never Sleep Again, the Elm Street Legacy from 2010 was being filmed, many of the cast spoke of their distaste and jealousy overnight, getting all the attention from their director some 20 years prior. Rennie Harlan flatly denies any romance rumors in his Finnish biography. Oh, he has a biography? No, a Finnish one. So I know that... 
oftentimes at horror conventions, they have a lot of cast together. And Tuesday night is almost always at these things. She's been at the one down here before. And a lot of the cast from this movie are together. So I'm kind of curious to see. I would just like probably get a ticket just to stand around and see if they talk to each other. I can't on Tuesday nights. You can't. You're busy Tuesday nights? <laughs> I'm busy Tuesday nights. <laughs> That's what I have to say. When you start saying goodnight. <laughs> goodnight. Tuesday goodnight. <laughs> So finally, Dutch director Dick Mass was offered to helm the project, but he had to decline due to scheduling conflicts with his thriller Amsterdam from 1988. Sorry, I just wanted to say Dick Mass. (laughs) That's a fucking porn. It's probably Dick Mass, but whatever. Dick Mass. Amsterdam, though. Yeah, we have to check that out. That sounds (laughs) interesting. Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Over the Amsterdam. <laughs> I kind of want to plan an entire trip to Europe now just to be like, what are you doing on your vacation? I'm Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Hoover well, damned. We should remake it for America. <laughs> Hoover damned. <laughs> we found our short. <gasps> we found our short film. Oh my God. Hoover damned. <laughs> um, oh, well, those were, that was a fun fact. Facts. Uh, uh, but we have some questions to ask about this movie, like we do. And uh, so, obviously, this is a horror movie, clearly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Were you scared while watching The Dream Master? No. <laughs> scared for your soul? Not even a little. No. Yeah, it's not It's not really a scary movie. There's gross parts to it, clearly, that we talked about. But, like, I feel like while I really enjoy Freddy Krueger and continue to do so throughout my entire life, like, he really loses a lot of his edge in this particular movie. Yeah. And in the, in the film for me, uh, just isn't, isn't very good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like depending on how you want to look at it, we're getting, well, let's get into ratings now then out of five stars. What would you rate the dream master? I gave it a one and a half. That's... To me, it was boring. There's not much going on. It wasn't very interesting. None of it was any better. Uh, if nothing else worse than everything else that I'd seen so far in the franchise, there was weird ADR uh, re-recorded audio in the first half of this movie. That was super distracting and weird to me. I, I feel like this is the first movie in this franchise where it starts to feel like a parody of itself, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, th- there were some times where the camera would get bumped into and like it would shake and they didn't like reshoot or anything that has used it. I was like, no one gave a shit about what they were doing here. Like what is going on on the set? You know, that I guess they're all just going through the motions, excited to make a movie, excited to get a job and not actually passionate about the material, mm-hmm. you know, or I don't know. Just, I just, it struck me. I was like, I'm watching something that looks like a shitty fucking TV movie in 1980. Eight, you know or whenever this was compared to 1968 looking at like 2001 a space odyssey by kubrick and i'm just like jesus christ like if i had just those two movies i'd say like what happened in human history where we lost all of our taste and our art and our technology to where we went that far downhill in 20 years between films you know I mean, I don't think it's that bad. I didn't give it much of a higher rating when I I first watched it. And I've got to learn to stop putting my ratings on Letterboxd immediately when the movie ends. You know what I mean? Because a lot of things happen sometimes whilst you're watching a movie that color my rating. Right. Like by the end of it, I was just like, that's really fucking gross to some of these things that were happening. And so I bumped it up a little bit. My initial reaction was like two and a half stars. And I was like, nah, that seems harsh. I gave it three, I had an extra half star. But now, after a couple of days, I was thinking about this movie like I always do. And I was like, it really wasn't that great, you know? No. But I don't think it's like complete trash either. So no. two stars is what I landed complete on. Complete trash this. would be one star. I give it one and a half. <laughs> Those half stars matter, they do. guys. They really do. There's some merit here because there's a couple of moments where I might have snickered. Mm-hmm. Organo, that's kind of cool. But they're like, you know, little morsels in a in a wasteland of, you know, trash. And so, like, it just – it's not very good to me. But also, I think I might have skipped this one where they didn't have it at the family video when I was renting everything from the series because mm-hmm. I think I must have skipped – or I've been told to skip straight to New Nightmare after after uh, Dream Warriors number three. Well, right? because I think this is my first time watching this one. 
I mean, that's, a, that's a three movie jump if you're jumping straight to New Nightmare. I mean, like, Freddy's dead alone. No, I must have seen one of them because there's a fucking highway scene that I keep yeah. remembering. And we're, we'll come up. I mean, there is a highway scene in New Nightmare, though. You know what I mean? So. Damn. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, like, that movie's a little less fantastical, a little bit more grounded. You know, so I, we'll, we'll see as we get through these movies. But yeah, I mean, like I said, it had been a long time since I had seen this one, too, and I'd forgotten a lot about, like, the intricacies of this movie you know and i was like it's just not really working for me and the thing is is that like dream warriors like i said in our last episode is one of my favorite horror movies or at least my comfort horror movie and comparatively this one is just not very good Mm -hmm. but i will say like based on what i've seen online a lot of people like this movie. I was just saying to you offline, yeah. like looking at the Wikipedia for this, like I've never seen a more pristine and like organized Wikipedia for a shitty movie, really. Right. And uh, man, like someone really cares. And it's high, fairly highly rated for what it is on Letterboxd. And so I think there's just a good section here where people have really big nostalgia boners. And that's true. And I I feel like the thing is that this movie was marketed in such a way and it made so much money that I feel like this is probably some people's first experience with Freddy Krueger when they were younger. Like they just didn't see it until after Dream Warriors. It's possible, you know, and so it's subjective. But I just have no nostalgia for this movie and in in a vacuum. It's just not very good. No. And but that's also my subjective opinion. And and my nostalgia is placed in the film prior to this, you know? And so like, I mean, obviously it's okay to, to like movies, but like, I don't know, just based on some of the things that I saw online, like people really, really like this one. And I'm a little flabbergasted by it when there are movies that came before this one and after this one in the franchise that are just far better. Yeah. You know? So, and that's just facts. Facts of life. Facts are facts, America. Finally, who's the hottest guy in Dream Master? Um, you know, I have to say that it's going to be Andrus Jones as Rick Johnson, which is, um, you know, Alice's brother. The martial arts enthusiast? Yes. The karate kid? I kind of liked him. He was cute. I really like Dan. I'm yeah, going, his first shot was nice, and then every other shot of him was like, mm. I'm just going traditional with this one. I mean, like, he's he's supposed to be the dreamy guy. I thought he was dreamy. I did when I was a kid. Like, my little budding gayness, I was just like, oh, he's attractive. And he's attractive in the next movie as well, so that'll probably be my pick. I haven't seen that one in a long time either, but I think the dance kind of hot. I think that just about wraps up our conversation on Dream Master. As always, we'd like to know what you think about this movie and our conversation about it. Find us on social media on Facebook, X, Instagram, threads, all the things, all the new things. You can email us at diagreens at filmflamers.com or call our hotline at 972-666-7733. Call us on Tuesday night. We'll see how we can fit you in. <laughs> how sweet, my fresh me. Check in. <laughs> come in or come out. <laughs> come into Weston and wait. <laughs> Craven in. Craven. Craven. We can't even say it. <laughs> Craven. Craven. In. <laughs> Craven. Do drop in at the Craven. <laughs> Tune in uh, next week on, or sometime on Patreon this month, where we'll be dropping the Dream Child. That's right, um, and that will be it for the Nightmare on Elm Street series until next year. So head over to Patreon.com/slash The Film Flamers, get that bonus episode, all of our bonus content, get our episodes early, and head over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts or really wherever you can rate us. And tell us why you like us. Give us a rating. We're going to read that on Shooting the Flames. What's going on next month? Next month, we have a whole bunch of 13s. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. That's right. We're going to see the 13th Warrior. That's right. I've never seen that movie. And I have been wanting to watch, rewatch 13 Ghosts for many years now. So we're doing that as well. I think we're going to watch the original or even have a poll over on Patreon of 13 Ghosts. Mm -hmm. And even more importantly, what else are we doing those 13? Top 13 X-Files episodes. 
we have been making our way through those and i'm ready to talk about it oh i'm so ready to talk about it god damn it <laughs> <laughs> it's been too long <laughs> all right chris i think it's time for me to go off and um hopefully after talking about this movie have some sweet, sweet dreams Ooh. I don't think there's any fear of that. I was trying to remember one-liners for the fucking like phone number thing. And I could not remember any. There's so many that I can't remember them. That's sad. That's sad. That's sad. Play Despacito. <laughs>